Hello, welcome my friends to another Art Chats in History where I do some art and we talk a little bit about the subject matter that we are working on. I thought, you know, I've had a bit of insomnia lately and I thought it would be a good go to do some art journaling about it and in hopes that it would get my anxiety out and help me to sleep. So here we're going to do some cartoon characters of myself um, unable to sleep and hopefully uh, change my perspective and since we are going to be doing that we might as well talk a little bit about perspective. Drawing in perspective can be one of those things that you learn at continuously over and over until you get it right. You can basically apply it to both um, humans, you can apply it to buildings, you can apply it to anything to give your piece some volume and shape and some dimension. Basically right here though, what I'm showing you, what I'm going to be showing you is a little cheat sheet I use when it comes to drawing with uh, the human body. And basically it's, you have your one point, which we're going to talk about perspective. It'll give you a little bit of history here in a little bit, but you have your one point perspective and then it comes out to a box. I'm going to create a box at the bottom here so that I can show you what should be larger and what should be smaller, which is what's going to give you the perspective. And for the human body, I tend to use this in any direction the human body is shaped, whether it's sideways, sitting down, standing up, etc, etc. But we'll get into that a little bit here, but let's talk a little bit about the history of perspective. So in art, perspective is called linear perspective, also known as point projection perspective, where you display a 3D object in a 2D space, right? There are four types of perspective, one point, two point, three point, and curvilinear. The best example of one point perspective is probably, you know, those terrible kid drawings of the horizon line and then there's like a mountain that meets in the middle and a road extends towards it, towards you. Which I'm displaying here in a uh, really quick, you know, sketch. But basically you have that vanishing point that brings the perspective towards you. So that's what I'm doing here is what I, when I create that vanishing point, I am going to make what's closer to you larger and what's further away smaller. The birth of perspective is largely attributed to the Florentine architect, Filippo Brunelleschi. In 1415, Brunelleschi with his Travelita, a small panel of wood would drill a hole and use it as and use a mirror to like una reverse the building basically and he did this in San Giovanni Square in Florence he portrayed the building looking through this hole to a mirror that reflected the drawing on his wood panel this gave him the unique point of view to create a perfect replica of the building on his drawing so basically as an architect he was able to bridge that you know math and art and make a perfect perspective of the building he was looking at and make an accurate, you know, observation of space, basically creating that illusion, you know, of space and depth in a painting, which is kind of what I like to do myself. But if you're going back to my terrible mountain drawing for a linear perspective, let's talk about it real quick. You have got a one point perspective along the horizon line, basically with a singular vanishing point which gives you that illusion of depth. When you have a two point perspective, you still have that horizon line, but now you have two vanishing points. The image will differ from what angle you look at the 3D subject on the 2D surface, but it won't move the vanishing points. So from the street level, there is like seeing the subject standing normal. If you were to look at it from the subject from the bird's eye view, it's like looking at it from a drone where your vanishing points are still the two points, but now you can see it from the top of the object. If you are looking from a worm's view, you still have that two vanishing points, but now it's like you are, you know, Buzz Lightyear catching up to the moving truck in Toy, Toy Story, which is one of my favorite movies, by the way. Anyways. Filippo Brunelleschi's drawing of the building would have had a two vanishing points by using his new perspective method. We can apply this approach with one and two point perspective to our art journal right here. 
I'm going to be drawing a few body perspective positions to the journal about my few weeks of the insomnia I was dealing with, uh, which largely had to do with the fact if you watch the art vlog, I'm getting some dental work done. But anyways, now that this one point perspective of a body can be laid out using the square and cylinder method that I was trying to show you earlier, the head of the vanishing point to the feet which are going to be much larger the closer it gets to you, it's creating these midpoints from head to foot. Early forms of the human perspective weren't really very accurate. Egyptian and Cretan paintings depict humans with the heads and legs in figure pose while the torso and eyes are in frontal pose. Before perspective during the Byzantine, Medieval, and Gothic periods, the illusion of death and space was not shown. The objects people's surroundings were compressed on a very shallow plane. Uh, before the Italian Renaissance in the early 15th century, where the mathematical laws of perspective were some say were rediscovered by Brunelleschi, early forms of the volume and art in the 1200s were explored by Giotto and Duccio turning the tides to the 3D perspective on a 2D surface. Here I am showing how to create the volume and depth of a person while using the one point perspective. The closer the object, the, bi the bigger the larger it is. And the further the object, the smaller into the vanishing point it goes. The volume of the body depends on the perspective of the vanishing point. As you can see, I am showing the feet take up the entire square closest to us, while the head compresses into the vanishing point. As I go about putting some of these um, cartoon characters and myself into my art journal, I will change the body's position, but keep in this theme of linear perspective where you have the vanishing point and then um, the larger area towards you to create depth and space and volume. On some ancient Greek pottery, you can see how they used shapes to make up the body. They would use the basic shapes of triangle, circle, square to comprise the body in figure pose, not always depicting very good perspective. As we reached the Renaissance era due to this new linear perspective rediscovered, painters like Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo, Botticelli, all of the greats, they went ahead and implored implored this into their work, coming out with some of the most representational art there is as far as proper perspective of the human body or of buildings. <laughs> Michelangelo in his sculptures in the Sistine Chapel commanded perspective of the human body. Raphael School of Athens demonstrated their new technique in like multi-point perspective. Leonardo da Vinci used linear perspective when he created the sketch for his unfinished painting of the Adoration of the Magi. Uh, Leonardo invented a machine called a perspectograph, which is a plane of glass that fit into a frame and which can also be held at a, for a small viewing point. This gave the artist a chance to make a rough sketch right onto the glass to outline the scene directly for a final piece later on painting. We kind of use this technique sometimes when we're trying to pick out a scene when we're out and about. If you're going plain air painting and you bring yourself a little square so that you can pick out a scene and then you can accurately depict those perspectives in that scene just for what you're looking at. There was this German artist, Durer. He published a book, The Artist's Manual, including this said perspective machine, such as Da Vinci's Perspectograph. Also, Vincent van Gogh had his own illustration of a perspective machine. So all these artists now are trying to, you know, incorporate this into their art to give their art some more depth and volume and accuracy. When I am sketching figures of myself struggling with sleep, I am using this concept of perspective along with techniques of foreshortening and volume. I use that same box and vanishing point as I showed you earlier to get the perspective I wanted. When I move to another angle of myself, I am still imploring that one point perspective, forcing my body to look larger, closer to us, and smaller along the horizon line. 
The next one, I tried to use a two-point perspective. I want my head to be along the horizon line, but instead of having just that one point where you only see one perspective, I angle my body to have two points, creating volume and depth. This was a bit of a struggle as I didn't implore the usual two-point vanishing point on either side of the object, but instead I'm having two vanishing points that go upward and towards us. Instead of like a building or something that has a very solid understanding of perspective, the human body is a little more fluid, so I changed my vanishing points to give myself some more depth. I did a quick face drawing and I kind of hated it, so I erased it. And then I did another foreshortening perspective of myself sitting and tired because <laughs> I was very tired. And art journaling gives us a way to change our own mental perspective. Just a little tidbit of information. It helped me actually get through this little spout of insomnia that I had and get myself some good old sleep. During the Baroque period, painters like Caravaggio used perspective to depict humans, objects, in a very skilled way, with light and juxtaposing to give a 2D paper some more of a 3D space. Adding in light, color, can further enhance the perspective of the drawing by adding some more weight and depth. It can speak volumes not just in what is pleasing to the artist's eye, but by creating an emotion or a feeling, giving the viewing person a perspective on what the artist is trying to say about their art. When I was struggling with sleeping this week, my mind would not shut off, and the more I tried, the worse it got. My perspective on whatever I was struggling with, including dealing with a little bit of pain from dental work, but that's besides the point. I was determined to <laughs> try to get some sleep and my lack of sleep was not helping. But just adding a little bit of color to a painting can actually describe the painting a little more to the viewer. When we moved into post-impressionism, artists like Paul Cezanne broke this mold of linear perspective, flattening the conventional painting, providing new modes of representation, giving away to cubism, which depicts a subject from multiple perspectives instead of accepting linear perspective. Nowadays, you can pretty much do however you like. Digital art has expanded the possibility of using this linear perspective to really give some amazing effects to depth and all those kinds of subject matters to give you a little more ideas. <laughs> Hold on, let's start that over. Oh, you know what? Let's just keep in it. Anyways, I'm getting about to the end of this art journal. Um, page and I just really appreciate y'all staying along here with me to watch if you are interested in some more history chats and art or art vlogs go ahead and subscribe um, we'll see y'all next week with another art vlog I think is coming up next week and then uh, I really appreciate y'all being here I'll talk to y'all soon thank you for watching cheers Michelangelo, Michelangelo, oh my goodness, how come I can't say his name like, I even said Brunelleschi correctly, Brunelleschi, 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 I think I got it, <laughs> oh my goodness.